Let me tell you a story. Let's begin today in the year 1775 in the country of Germany at the University of Göttingen or Göttingen, G-O-T-T-I-N-G-E-N, University of Göttingen. A young man studying medicine there in 1775 publishes his thesis called On the Natural Variety of Mankind. On the Natural Variety of Mankind. And in his thesis, this young man explored the classification of human races based upon craniological research. Craniological being, just what you think, being the study of the hard casing enclosing the human brain, that being the human skull. So in his 1775 medical doctoral thesis, this young man began to look at the size and shape of the human skull. And he began to draw some conclusions. And I want to underscore here right off the break that this gentleman was not studying the brain itself. He was studying the hard material encasing and closing the brain. He was studying the size and shape of the human skull. That is an important fact and distinction to keep in your mind and in your consciousness as we delve deeper into this conversation. So again, that was in 1775. And in 1779, some four years later, this same young man, based upon his continued cranial research, he divided the human species into five races based upon his examination of skulls, five human races. And he broke down those races as follows. Number one, the Caucasian or white race. Number two, the Mongolian or yellow race, including all East Asians and some Central Asians. Number three, the Malayan or brown race, including Southeast Asian and Pacific Islander. Number four, the Ethiopian or black race, including Sub-Saharan Africans. Number five, the American or red race, including American Indians. And again, all of this was based upon this young man's craniological research, all right, his study of the human skull. And his name was Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, a German national, a man of European descent, a physician, physiologist, and anthropologist. In 1779, Blumenbach divided the human species into five races, all based upon his research and observations of about 66 zero human skulls. So let that sink in a bit, brothers and sisters. Now, at that point in the development of thought in the world of ideas in European society, in that period that is called, as we discussed last time, the Age of Enlightenment or the Age of Reason, there had emerged at that time two predominant philosophies as to the origins of humankind. First, there were those who took the biblical view. No surprise there. Those that believe that human beings are one species and that race represents variations in and variations of that one human species. That's the Bible view. And that belief was known as monogenism or monogenism. Mono being one and Genesis meaning origin. So one origin. And so these folks were known as monogenous, believing in one human species with lots of variation within that one species. And then you had the second group of people. And those folks believe that human beings evolved from several independent pairs of ancestors. And this was known as polygenism. Poly being many and Genesis being origin. So many origins. And these folks were known as polygenous or polygenous, meaning they believe that human beings evolved from multiple species. And this group would later be known as maybe you've heard this term pluralists. Now, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who studied the human skulls and based upon that research, divided mankind into five races. Blumenbach subscribed to monogenism or monogenism, and he was considered a monogenist. And he argued in his work that human, listen to this, brothers and sisters, he argued in his work that human physical characteristics like skin color and cranial profile depended on geography and diet and mannerism. So Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, he held to what is called the degenerative hypothesis of racial origins. Well, what is the degenerative hypothesis? Blumenbach believed that Adam and Eve were Caucasians dwelling in Asia and that other races, quote unquote, degenerated from this original white stock as a result of environmental factors like geography. 
and the cold of the wind in Europe and the heat of the sun in sub-Saharan Africa and the varying quality of available food sources, let's say in North, Central and South Americas. All these factors would help and contribute to the degeneration of the races from this original Caucasian white stock. Now get this. Blumenbach also believed that this whole, (laughs) this makes me laugh, this whole degenerative process could be reversed. That in the right environment and under the right circumstances and with the proper diet, that all forms of man, all the quote unquote degenerated races like Negroes and Eskimos and the Chinese and American Indians, they could all be reverted back to the original Caucasian race. And I will remind you here, brothers and sisters, at this point that Johann Friedrich Blumenbach was a respected scientist of his day. So this work brought forward by Johann Friedrich Blumenbach is another deep root of racism. And that is not to say, I want to be very clear about this, that is not to say that Brother Blumenbach himself was racist or that his ideas were or are inherently racist. The point I want to make here is that the introduction of these ideas and philosophies into polite society during the time of the scientific revolution leading into the age of enlightenment in the early modern period of human history, these ideas in the name of science, racist or not, allowed for those who were overtly racist, those ideas allowed racists to co-opt those scientific findings by Blumenbach and to use those ideas in the name of science to further an overtly racist political, social, and scientific agenda at that time and to impose and inflict those racist ideas onto the larger society in which they live. It is the co-opting of ideas in the name of science to perpetuate a racist political agenda. That's the larger point that I would like to make here. So for the past few conversations, we have been talking about the deep roots of racism and the work of Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, brothers and sisters, is yet another deep root of racism in our contemporary society. The last time we were together, we pulled up another deep root of racism in discussing the work of Mr. Carl Linnaeus, who was the first of the Age of Enlightenment philosophers to describe human beings just as he described any other plant or animal. And as we discussed last time, he did that by examining several monkeys and noting the similarities between the monkeys and man. And Carl Linnaeus pointed out that both species basically have the same anatomy, except for speech. And he found no other differences between monkeys and man. And Carl Linnaeus went on to, as we discussed, subdivide the human species into four varieties. Now, he did his work based on continent, so where these people were located, and skin color. And he later further detailed what he saw as the stereotypical characteristics for each of those four varieties of the species of man. And Carl Linnaeus, did all of that. He did his work around the time of 1758. He is the first deep root of racism that we have discussed and dug up. And today we add the work of Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who, as we have stated, divided humankind into four races based upon his craniological research, the study of human skulls. And Blumenbach did the bulk of his work around the time of 1779. So he is the second deep root of racism that I'm putting on the table for further research and reflection this morning. Carl Linnaeus and Johann Friedrich Blumenbach are two of the deep roots of racism. If you dig back far enough and deep enough, And their work is at the foundation of how we perceive race and experience racism in contemporary society.